When I first accepted Christ in high school, uh, it was something that, that I took very seriously uh, from, from the start, you know, trying to, to live my life, you know, follow in Christ's footsteps and, you know, just follow his lead in, in serving. I started out uh, pretty soon after I started attending Shoreline, uh, started out on the, the Pacific Grove campus production team. Uh, I work in TV news, and it just kind of came naturally, you know, that I would I would help out with the Shoreline production because I work in TV production. After that, I just kind of branched out. Uh, I do some side work in social media, so I met up with the communication director here at Shoreline, Donna Brown, and told her I was interested in, in interested in helping them out, uh, however I could, uh, running Facebook, Instagram stuff like that and since then I've also been in charge of running social media for the organic outreach conference uh, the last two years. I really don't want to go to a church and just be a consumer. I want to give back and to serve however I can because Christ himself said that he didn't come to be served but to serve. We're called to follow his example so I'm just following his example being a servant you know wherever I'm needed and it's it's tough I mean we all know it's it's difficult but just to try to to frame our lives our actions our thoughts in the same way that that Christ would have would have received people um, you know that's that's a big deal to me seeing people who are kind of forgotten or um, ignored you know, those are the people that, that Christ really reached out to. And I try to do the same thing, just, you know, paying attention to people that, even if it's something as simple as, you know, a, a server at a restaurant, you know, they aren't always treated the best. And, you know, just, just talking to people and showing them love, treating people with love, living your life with love, that's, that's how I try to be all in. to do one important thing. Well, good morning. It's great to be here. Wonderful. We are in week three of our All In series where we've been asking the question, will you go all in and all out for the all in all, the one who gave all, Jesus Christ. And it's been an amazing series. And so during this series, we've looked the last two weeks at what it means to go all in. And now this week, we're going to look at what it means to go all out. And those words, all out, I mean, they carry some pretty powerful connotations, don't they? All out, max effort. Give, you, give it your best, right? They also carry some pretty, a memory of some pretty humbling circumstances and experience I had when I was a young Army captain back in 1997 when I was serving at Fort Campbell, Kentucky with the 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles. I can get a who out there, any whoas? Oh, no screaming eagles. <laughs> well, anyways, what I learned on that day as I was in a really unique position, as I was hanging out the door of a UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter hooked up to a rope getting ready to do a 90-foot combat rappel. That was my mission, a simple mission. And I had some simple tasks. Oh, let's see, hook up, right, make sure, okay, here's my guide arm, here's my brake arm, make sure I bend my knees, assume a good L position, and then push off, and as I do, simultaneously extend my brake arm all the way out. Now, it sounds beautiful, doesn't it? How many of you have had the opportunity to repel out of a UH-60 Blackhawk helicopter? What? Well, since we couldn't do it, let's show you a video of what this looks like. It's a beautiful thing, huh? Beautiful. Right. Yeah. 
air assault. It's beautiful when done correctly. <laughs> guess what? Well, I did my air assault repel. I did, I did everything correctly except for I forgot one important thing. And that was to extend that brake arm. And so when I, I pushed off and got his, oh, it was a beautiful push off, I just forgot to put that arm out and go all the way out. And guess what happened to the friction on that rope, right? That normally goes away when your arm's out here, that rope can slide freely, right? Well, Mr. Friction caught up with me as I was about five feet under the helicopter, and it caught me, and it pushed me straight up. And with all that force and all that weight on my back, I went straight up, upside down, just like a possum, right? And there I was, hanging underneath a 10-ton aircraft with all that noise, all that stuff going on around. And there I was with nowhere to go. And, you know, kind of strange it was actually kind of peaceful up there, you know. It was kind of comfortable. For a while, I started thinking, this is comfortable. And I realized maybe that was just the blood rushing to my head. But I finally remembered this was not my mission. This was not the mission that I was charged to do. And I also had a prompt reminder from the gentle voice of a non-commissioned officer, our rappel master, who was leaning out the door of the helicopter, and he's yelling, all the way out, sir, all the way out. And all I heard was, all out. And I'm like, oh, yeah, break arm out. So I kicked that arm out, and at that point, eventually gravity took over, and that rope started to slide. My feet came down, and I landed safely on the ground. Guys, I can't, I'm not making this up. Uh, you can't make it up. In fact, on the ground, unbeknownst to me, was my loving bride and our four children, and they were watching, and they're like, who's that poor man stuck up underneath the helicopter? <laughs> and when they asked me about it, I said, I have no idea who that poor guy was. <laughs> no, humble experience. And I learned a very important lesson that day. And I sometimes I think as Christians, have we gotten too comfortable in a position where we're not supposed to be? Have we truly gone all out for the one who gave all? Jesus Christ. And so I think about that, and I think we can get too comfortable, can't we? And when we get comfortable, we forget about the mission that Jesus Christ calls us to. And see, Jesus didn't call us to a life of comfort. He called us to a life of commitment. A commitment to go wherever he calls us to go and do what he commands us to do. And so today, I want to just answer that question, what does it mean to go all out for Jesus? And I think there's really two components. There's that maximal effort, but there's also a missional focus. And we think about Jesus. What was the mission that we're supposed to fulfill? Jesus, in some of his final words to his disciples, gives the most clear and concise mission statement I've ever received or ever heard of. And that was when he called his disciples. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Clear and concise. A mission statement that commanded his disciples to go and make disciples to baptize them, and to teach them to obey what Jesus had commanded. And as his followers today, that mission hasn't changed. We've not received a change to mission. And so today we're commanded to do the same. And we can't be comfortable just knowing about Jesus and knowing about that mission. We have to truly obey him and go wherever he calls us and do what he commands us to do, to go and show mercy, to go and share his love, to go and proclaim the gospel, and to go and make disciples. We're called to be goers and doers for Jesus. Go and do. And the Bible's full of example of folks who were goers and doers for Jesus. 
And one in particular that I've, I've just become uh, fascinated with as I've studied through the book of Acts in greater detail is a guy named Philip. Now, Philip, for some of you, you might be thinking, oh, that's the guy who was one of the, the apostles. He was a disciple of Jesus, and this is not that Philip. This is a more ordinary guy. In fact, Philip, we're going to take a look at his life, and we're going to examine some different, look at four scenes from his life and say, what can we learn? What can we take away from this goer and doer for Jesus? And so what I want to do is open up with scene one, and it's Philip in Jerusalem. And so here's this guy, Philip. We don't know much about him, but we find out this is the first time we hear about him, and it won't be the last. We begin in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And this proposal pleased the whole group. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And so what we have here is the 12 apostles, they had a, a situation they had needs from the community, these two different groups of Jewish believers, and they needed to provide for the widows. And so rather than the apostles doing it themselves, they went to the disciples and said, hey, pick seven men, and then we'll let them oversee this. And so what do we learn about Philip? How did he get his start in ministry? He was working in the hospitality ministry, right? He was essentially, like we do today, cutting up donuts, right? Sharing bagels, making sure that the widows got what they needed. He was doing what God called him to do at that time. And then what was the effect of how God worked through the apostles and these seven men and the church at that time? The church grew in numbers and the gospel spread. Amazing. And what we know when the gospel spread, unfortunately, at the same time, if you read the book of Acts chapter 7... You know that there's this tremendous persecution that breaks out. And we hear the story of one of these seven men, Stephen, who's actually brutally murdered. And at the end of that chapter, in the beginning of the next chapter, Acts 8, we learn of a man named Saul who was there who endorsed the killing of Stephen. No doubt somebody that Philip probably knew very well. And there was Saul. And with that, the church then was scattered. And one of those guys was Philip. And so now we read about Philip. The next time we read of Philip, he's now in a place called Samaria. Reading from Acts 8, and uh, we'll start with verse 4. Those who'd been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now, it's easy to read that and just kind of gloss over. But do you get the relationship between a devout Jew and a follower of Judaism and Samaria? You see, Samaria was an area where no devout Jew would go. Nor would any devout Jew want to associate with anybody that was a Samaritan. And, but yet here was Philip. He'd been scattered, and he, what did he do? He was a pioneer in breaking down cultural and racial and religious barriers, faithful to what God was calling him to do. And when he went there, he was casting out demons. He was healing the broken, and he was sharing the good news of Jesus. Remember how Philip got his start? He was in the hospitality ministry. Amazing. And when you read that last, that last line, there was great joy in the city. With that, if you read the book of Acts, really every time Luke refers to the term joy, 
it really means that they had accepted Jesus. They had believed in Jesus, as we read in verse 12. But when they believed, Philip, and as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Do you get that? This is, here's Philip. He's, he's on mission. He's fully completed the mission that Jesus called him to do, right? Philip's not done yet, though. Somehow he ends up back in Jerusalem. And when he's in Jerusalem, he was still ready to go and do what Jesus was calling him to do. He was ready to go break down some more cultural barriers for Jesus. He was ready to go share the gospel. Acts 8, verses 26 to 34, we read more on Philip's story. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And so he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candate, which means the queen of, queen of the Ethiopians. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in the chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And so what we know is that this Ethiopian man was a man of very high influence, high level of influence, and he had high level of access, did he not? But he was significantly different than Philip, wasn't he? But that didn't stop Philip. We read that it's a spirit now. We had the angel telling him to go south, and now we have the spirit, the Holy Spirit, telling Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Listen to how Philip responds. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. I mean, that is amazing. Notice Philip's response. He didn't just meander. He ran up to the chariot. Now, I don't know. Maybe the chariot was moving. I suspect it probably was. And so there's Philip, right? He's running up there. He said, I'm not wasting time. Intentionality, urgency. Philip was there. And then it was common in that time that when people read Scripture, they would read it out loud. And so Philip got close enough where he could actually hear what was being read. And the passage of Scripture that the eunuch was reading, it's that beautiful passage from Isaiah 53. I want you just to listen to these words and reflect on who do you think this is referring to. It says, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Who's that referring to? Jesus, right? It was an opportunity now for Philip to actually help this man understand what it was he was reading the story of Jesus, the suffering servant, the prophecy of Isaiah. And so verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. You see, Philip shared the gospel, and by all indications, this Ethiopian man accepted he entered into a saving faith in Jesus Christ. He went all in for Jesus. How do we know this? We read later. It's a, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again but went on his way rejoicing. There's that, that form of joy again, rejoicing. This man had accepted Christ, and the joy of salvation was on him, upon him, in him. Went on his way rejoicing. Philip brought a lot of joy, didn't he, wherever he went. Isn't that amazing? And we think about that, that historians believe that this man, this Ethiopian man, actually became the first missionary to the continent of Africa a continent where today there are over 500 million Christians. Think about that. If you do the math, that's one in four Christians across the world actually live in Africa. One man's faithfulness, willingness to share the gospel. And today we can see some of the fruit of that, huh? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. But Philip wasn't done yet, though. Philip, 
it says in verse 40, that Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. He was going and doing, sharing the gospel. He was going all out for Jesus wherever he went. And now we're going to move to scene four, the last time we hear Philip's name in the, in the Bible. And as we look, a time of about 20 years has elapsed. So we're going to jump forward to Acts 21. Acts 21, verses 8 and 9. Leaving the next day, we, and the we there, is the author of the book of Acts, which is a man named Luke, who wrote Acts, and Paul. They reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. So here's Philip, continuing to serve God faithfully. He's no longer out on the trail, right, sharing the gospel at places like Samaria and the desert road. But Philip has now raised a godly family. Four daughters, and, the, and the, really the understanding here is that they had been set apart for service to the Lord. Amazing story. And what's even more amazing, I think, about that is the fact that at that time, he's welcoming this guy named Paul into his home. And who was Paul? 20 years earlier, Paul was the guy, Saul, who had his friend Stephen murdered. Saul was the guy who had drugged people out of their homes. Probably a lot of them were friends of Philip's and had them imprisoned or murdered. And here he was now, Paul, a changed man, and Philip opening his home, welcoming Paul into his home. And so we reflect on Philip's life. We think, what kind of lessons can we learn? And I think there's really five big lessons we can learn. Lesson number one. Be faithful however you serve. Be faithful. And Philip served faithfully. From the first time to the last time, we see this model of a faithful servant, someone who was faithfully fulfilling the mission of Jesus Christ to go and do. And we think about us, our story. Like Philip, we're also called to live a life that's marked by faithfulness, are we not? Faithful. We're devoted to God, and we're, we're faithful in carrying out the mission of Christ. Be faithful however you serve. And how do we do this? I mean, how can we be faithful wherever we serve? Well, we need to be like Philip. We've got to stay connected to the Holy Spirit. We've got to stay connected to God. And we can do that. We do that when we study his word. And we dive into the word every morning, every evening, whenever that might be. We constantly are soaking in. We're spending time at the feet of Jesus so that we know where it is he wants us to go and what it is he wants us to do. We also do through prayer, right? We continue to draw close to him, communicating, asking for his direction, his vision, his guidance in our life. You see, Jesus wants to change people's lives. And guess who he chose to do that through? us, his followers. And so we are called to be faithful no matter how or where we serve. It might be, and we think about, you don't have to go all the way around the world to be faithful to serve, right? Philip started out in the hospitality ministry. He ended his life. At the end of his life, he was raising his family. So be faithful wherever you're called. Maybe for you, it's a season of life where you've got five little ones at home that's where God's called you. Be faithful in that. Maybe God's calling you to go overseas, to do something beyond the borders of the United States. Be faithful in that. Wherever we're called, be faithful wherever we're served. So I want to issue a challenge. Challenge number one. Will you commit to setting aside one hour this week to seek solitude and silence and prayer and to, and to ask God, just to show you one area in your life, one area that you need to be more faithful in serving him. I don't know what that area is for you. We all probably have areas in our life. So will you seek solitude? Will you intentionally set aside a time where you can just get away quiet and just pray and ask God to speak to you about that area? I think the second lesson we learn from the life of Philip is we're called to be available whenever and wherever we're called. And we know from Philip's story, 
just like being faithful the first time to the last time, Philip, he's ready, he's willing, and he's able to go and serve. Is he not? Whether he's in Jerusalem or Samaria or on some dry desert road chasing down a chariot, he's ready and willing and able to go. Is he not? And so we also, we need to be ready, and we need to be willing, and we need to be able to go and ready. Again, we need to be prepared, so we have to spend time with Jesus. We need to be willing, even if it means that God would ask us to go to a place like Samaria. What's your Samaria? Lord, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything, but don't send me there. Guys, my wife and I were married for seven years. Seven years. And I was not a Christian. My wife was. And in that seventh year, my wife introduced me to Jesus. She faithfully proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my life has changed forever. And so are my children and so are my grandchildren. And I hope my great-grandchildren and beyond. Because my wife was not just, she was ready, she was willing, and she was able to share the gospel. And so you, think about that. It might be a hard place for you to share the gospel. You might be overlooking that area right now, and that's where God's called you to share, to go and do what he commands you to do. And so this week, I want to challenge you. Will you commit to just set aside one hour in the coming week, one day in the coming month, and one week in the coming year to serve him locally, nationally, or even globally? Will you set aside some time to do that? And this is a great opportunity. Maybe you say, I I can only serve an hour, and I can do it. Maybe I can do it here on campus. We would love for you to connect with us at the Connection Center. Maybe you say, you know, I want to do something in the community. We'll get you We're going to have a tent set up. We have a tent already set up out there, our community outreach. And you say, well, maybe I want to serve internationally. Pastor John shared some of the needs earlier, some of the missions that are ongoing. If that's where you feel God's calling you and you have time and you are at a life stage where you can do that, be obedient to God's call. Be faithful and be intentional in setting aside time to do that. And that's our third lesson. Be intentional, whomever you encounter. Think about Philip. Philip, he encountered people that were a lot different than he was, didn't he? And yet that didn't stop him. He was intentional. He was intentional at at being responsive to the spirit where the spirit led, and he placed himself in proximity to that chariot so he could hear the man speaking, and he could enter into a, a spiritual conversation. He was intentional. He was also intentional in his conversation. He was asking questions, allowing the man to respond. We need to do the same. We're called to live a life marked by intentionality, to go and do what God calls us to do. We're called to be grace bearers, but we're also called to be truth sharers, right? Which means when the opportunity affords itself, we need to be intentional about sharing the gospel sharing the truth of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 4.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. With gentleness and respect is absolutely important, but we need to be prepared. That's what Peter is saying. Be prepared to give an answer to the hope that you have. That's part of being intentional. We're ready to go. And we know that spiritual conversations can be really difficult conversations, can't they? But they're really critical conversations. My wife had one of those conversations with me seven years after our marriage. You might need to have one of those critical conversations with someone that you're reflecting on right now. And we do that with intentionality. And so what I want to do is I want to challenge you. 
that will you commit to intentionally enter into a conversation with someone who's not a Christian and follow the Spirit's leading in sharing your faith, just sharing your faith in Jesus? Will you enter into a conversation and then as the Spirit leads, will you be faithful in sharing your faith in Jesus? And lesson number four, be teachable whatever your circumstances. I mean, Philip was in some pretty amazing circumstances, was he not? But throughout, it's just, I noticed that Philip was very teachable. And what does it mean to be teachable? Well, it means to be humble. It means, means to be really be respectful. And it need, means really to be moldable, to allow God to mold us and shape us and to teach us so that we are then able to teach others. But it starts with humility. And in this case, if you look at Philip's story, he was very intentional, but he was also teachable. When the man was asking questions, he embraced those questions and responded with dignity and respect. When you think about us, we also are called to be teachable. And so how do we remain teachable? Again, we stay connected. We stay connected to the humble servant, Jesus Christ. And Jesus will allow us to do that. And as we remain teachable, then we're also able to teach others. And we do that through the study, the immersion in God's word. So that when the opportunity comes, we can share that. We're able to teach because we remain teachable. And so this week, your challenge, will you actually spend some time in God's word? Will you commit to reading and studying God's word? Daily, and then writing down, this is the key, writing down at least one thing that God is teaching you. That's one of the most important things. And, and I've not been very good at this. I'll, I, I had a tendency, uh, before I came to Shoreline, I would read scripture, and I'd go, wow, that's really fascinating. This year, I'm trying to be more intentional to write down, what is it that God's teaching me? And what's amazing is how God will use that, and I'm able to share that with others. So will you intentionally set aside, when you read this, will you just spend some time and jot down, what is it that God's teaching me through this? We need to be teachable. And the final lesson we learn is that we should be hospitable wherever you live and regardless of your resources. Be hospitable. That means to treat others with dignity and respect, to be cordial and friendly to strangers. I mean, remember Philip? Philip, again, started out hospitality, and how did he finish his life? The last we read, he was still practicing hospitality, being hospitable, welcoming these guests. And we should be the same, welcoming strangers into our church, which I see every day. That is a distinctive of, of Shoreline Church, the most welcoming church my wife and I have ever attended. Practicing hospitality is really part of Shoreline's DNA. And aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that we do that? And so this week, I want to just, I want to challenge you in that area as well. Will you intentionally bless one person this week through sharing of your resources, your possessions, or maybe it's even your own home? In some capacity, will you be willing to be hospitable and practice hospitality with others, just as Philip did. And so five lessons and five challenges. The question is now, are we willing to go do? To go where we're called to go and to do what Jesus commanded us to do. And so as I reflect on Philip's story, and it's amazing testimony of just how God used Philip, a man who went all out for Jesus. Amazing testimony. He went where he was called to go. He did what he was commanded to do. And I think about this. I think, imagine Philip when he breathed his last breath on this earth. And at some point, he opened his eyes and there was his, his Savior, Jesus Christ, saying, well done, and Jesus says, we've been waiting for you. And all around, Jesus, 
are hundreds of Ethiopians, hundreds of Samaritans, hundreds of people who have been affected, have been, have been changed for eternity because of Philip's faithfulness and going and doing what he was commanded to do. Now imagine your life, your last breath. Maybe your families are with you and gathered around and you take that final breath and when you open your eyes, there's Jesus. And Jesus says, well done. And all around are people who were there because you were faithful. You heard the call to go and do. And they're there. And now I want you to imagine. Think of those people right now who you know need to hear Jesus. They need to know Jesus. They need to have a saving faith in Jesus. Don't you want them to be there with you as well? And so today what I want to do is I want to, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask the band to come up here. And we're going to actually do a response song. We're going we're to celebrate at the end of this, the song that Heather led during our giving back time, for the sake of the world. And so I'm going to pray. And I'm just going to, I'm praying that this will be the song of our hearts today and for the rest of our lives, for as long as we have breath on this earth, this will be our prayer, that we will go wherever we're called to go and to do what we're commanded to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you first and foremost for Jesus, and we thank you for the eternal life that only he offers. And Lord, we thank you for the faithful servant, Philip. And so Lord, now as we, we get ready to sing this song, Lord, we think of people that don't yet know you, we know that it's not just across the world, but it may be even in our own home and it may be even in our neighborhood. Father, would our hearts burn for the love that you have for them and will we be willing to go and do what you call us to do. We pray this all in Jesus' name.